Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Foster. I'm the chair of the HE Hall of Fame committee, and uh, we're we're delighted to have uh, Warren Dorr with us. And uh, uh, before we introduce Warren, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this room. Uh, two years ago, the uh, AT Museum took over the Iron Masters Hostel, and that's a good thing, but our timing couldn't have been worse because that was the beginning of the pandemic, and we haven't been able to do all the stuff that we wanted to do, but we're, and, uh, except for a couple of employees, we're, we're an all-volunteer organization, so it's a process and we'll get there. But one of the things we have done is we've begun to turn this room into the AT Hall of Fame room, and uh, to start that process, we put up uh, plaques from the first four years of the Hall of Fame classes. We're going to have plaques created for the remaining classes, including the 2022 class. And we've, uh, one of our great friends, Bruce Dunlavey, has created this uh, rack uh, for, uh, to store the Hall of Fame uh, sticks. We, uh, uh, Bodacious, and Bodacious is not here yet, I don't know where Bodacious is, uh, but uh, uh, Bodacious of course creates the Hall of Fame sticks for us and there's uh, some information on Bodacious and there's a class stick that he, that he makes every year to, uh, to, uh, for, for us and, and those sticks are here. We, all, we, have, we also have one stick out here which is for people to take pictures with and so forth and one thing we hope to get Warren is a picture of you with this stick. Um, so uh, welcome, and this is the first event we've had in the uh, Hall of Fame room, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bill O'Brien. Thanks. Um, I have two introductions to make for Warren <laughs> now and later, so I'm going to keep this one really short. Um, it's obviously in this room the person who uh, least needs uh, an introduction. <laughs> And it's uh, much better to uh, hear from Warren himself than from somebody uh, talking about Warren. But I will have a few other words uh, a lot better to say later on. So Warren, without any further ado, uh, here you go. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I will. Uh, say this now and also at the gathering uh, <clears throat> 40 years of Alda and, and uh, no one has given Alda his heart and his effort for so many years than you and uh, thank you so much and uh, I also was at our steering committee meeting when Larry Luxembourg came to it and had this idea about the Appalachian Trail Museum and uh, I remember voting uh, to give them seed money. And I don't know of a more beautiful crop that has grown out of those seeds than what you've done here, Larry, and all the other people you brought along with you. So it is an, uh, certainly an honor for me to uh, speak before everybody, but especially Bill and Larry. And uh, I want to thank the Hall of Fame committee for giving me this opportunity. Um, I also want to thank those people who felt me worthy of induction. I know it, it wasn't unanimous, so. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, it's a short time uh, that I have, uh, and I'll be doing my longer programs at the gathering up in Williams College. And so I'm just gonna talk about epiphanies uh, today. And I won't be able to include them all. Uh, the trail to me is a 2,193 or 94 mile scrapbook of memories. Freedom, simplicity, adventure, challenge, peace, and friendships. Shared miseries, shared accomplishments, the joy, the loneliness, 
all the good things that make us human. As Don West, my mentor, said, uh, to take pride in being humor, human, to take imagination, to be human, to take love, to be human, and to have courage, courage to be human. And the trail to me is not miles or ounces or carbide or carbon whatever and lightweight material. It's not miles. It's not things. But uh, it's my higher love. And no matter how much I've given the trail over the late years, it's always given me much, much more back. And it has never let me down. And everything the trail has done for me and to me, I trust completely. So that's what the white blazes. And I thank, I want to thank first and more, foremost all the volunteers through decades and decades and decades who've kept those white blazes continuous and has helped pilgrims like me and people who will follow me to be able to maybe have an opportunity to receive those same gifts that I have received. So epiphanies. I wouldn't have had these epiphanies if it wasn't for a trail. I'm going to try to do four. I might not have enough time, so but I'm watching my watch. Uh, one that takes place in Baker Peak on the AT and Long Trail, appropriate. Um, another one takes place at Spec Pond in the Mahoosics. Another one takes place out west. I'm going to include the John Muir Trail. And uh, another one is from the base of the Holy Mountain. So the first one is Baker Peak, a beautiful rock outcropping, deep, deep valley at Route 7, runs through mountains off to the west near sunset. I put my camp in the pine trees where there are some pine needles right near that rock outcropping and I went out on the rock outcropping and I laid down on this solid, solid, long-lasting rock, the bedrock. And uh, the moon was coming up from the east. It was rising. And the sun was going down in the west. And I had my headphones on back then. They weren't smartphones or whatever. But you had your radio and your little headphones. <laughs> And uh, I was listening to National Public Radio, uh, Shamrock and the Thistle, is that what it's called? Celtic music, you know, music I love to dance to. <clears throat> and it was just beautiful music. And the music helped make me aware of this changing colors of the sky, the cyclical nature of this life on this planet that I was laying down on, on the solid bedrock, but there was change above me. There was change above me. And the eastern side of the mountains to my west were dark, and the top of those mountains were alpine glow. And way to the east, it was dark behind the moon, below the moon, and it was like orange and pink all the way across. And I l laid there with that music, and I reached out towards that sky, and my palm reflected the alpine glow of the sunset, and the top of my hand 
reflected the ever-darkening sky. And I was moving my hand back and forth. And at that point in time, I was so thankful I was there. Because you really never experience really anything of meaning unless you put yourself out there. If you give yourself the opportunity to put yourself out there. And I said, this is the way I want my life to be. And maybe this is the way my life, life has been. To be able to lay on bedrock, the stability of bedrock, the practicality of life, the realism of life, and to be steady, but still to be able to reach out and appreciate change, but always from a point of stability. So that was one epiphany that has stood with me. And every time I pass that spot at Baker Peak, or every time now that I pass it way down below, I think of that lesson. <clears throat> Speck Pond, supposedly one of the highest ponds in the state of Maine. Small by Maine standards. It actually is a pond. You know, some of these ponds we would call lakes. <clears throat> it was uh, summer, but cloudy, very foggy down into the depression that the Speck Pond is. And I was really looking forward to my annual swim in Speck Pond, sort of annual. <clears throat> and so when I got down there, I stood on this little rock where I usually shallow dive off of, but I could see nothing, nothing. I could hardly see the water five feet below me. And everything was just foggy. And since it was so foggy, I took off all my clothes because no one was going to see me. Thank goodness. I wasn't like Orca the white whale there like I am now, but um, I would like to think I was more like a dolphin. Um, but I just jumped right in. I said, well, there's no roads here, so there's not an abandoned car in the water. <laughs> The bottom hasn't changed, but I still thought, well, I hope there's not a downed tree. And I checked to make sure there weren't any downed trees on either side of me because I didn't want to dive into a tree. And so I dived in and swam underwater. And when I got, put my head above water, it was like just as murky as being underwater. And I just swam swim. And I don't know how far out I got, but I came to realiz realization when I looked around, <laughs> how do I get back? <laughs> how do I get back to that rock? How do I get back to where my clothes were? <laughs> And I thought of John Muir, this sixth sense he talks about. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't stricken with fear. And I just started swimming back. I finally came right to the rock, about that far away from me. So that told me a little bit about also putting yourself out there. You know, fear is rampant. And as John Muir said, learn wildness and you don't fear anything except people afraid. And the last two and a half years of my life, I'm not sad for myself or my loved ones, but I, I'm just sad, I'm saddened by what has happened to the beauty that resides within us all. Third 
epiphany. It was my third time walking the John Muir Trail, and yes, I've done other trails besides the AT. Second time I did the AT was this lovely human being, Terry. John Muir Trail, yeah, thank you. We've also done the AT together as well. Uh, it's third time. And I carried, I didn't want to resupply. I was 62 years old. It was my last serious backpack. So I didn't want to resupply. So I carried like 13 days of a big bag of protein powder. And all I had was protein shakes the entire time. It was better than the five boxes of Little Debbie Cosmic Brownies that I had <laughs> my second traverse. And I was the only one drinking untreated water in my Sierra cup. And I just make protein shakes, carry everything on my back. And it was just beautiful. The range of light, beautiful, 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 stunning, overpowering with beauty. And then after I was over, I, my, one of my former students who, who was the one that invited me, I drove him back to Las Vegas to fly back to the east. And I drove then, you know, through the desert to Park City, Utah, home of the former Winter Olympics. And I was going to, to go to a contra dance weekend. It was at, it's the highest altitude contra dance weekend in the nation. 9,500 feet above sea level. So the people who have trouble dancing never come back again. Um, and I got there in time for the afternoon dance and I put on my flowery, batiked dancing clothes and I jumped into the line and the mean, a band called the Mean Lids, they're not mean at all, were playing and they were playing this like trance dance and I got in that line and people were, hands were touching, smiles were reflecting, eyes were connecting. And I just started crying. Beautiful music. People making this music out of instruments that were human made. People who were making movement, not machines. And I just cried. And people knew from my tears that I wasn't crying out of sadness. They weren't going to say, what's wrong? Are you sad? These were tears of joy. And after that, you know, I didn't really, I, I lost all of my emotional fat in Pennsylvania in 1973 near Port Clinton. Um, I started to process, why did I react that way? And this is the epiphany I got from that. I had just spent almost two weeks with tremendous natural beauty. And now I'm here with human beauty. And at that point in time, you know, I think there's two types of beauty. There's natural beauty and there's human beauty. That's why I'm an educator. And I said, if I had to do, you know, you know, sometimes you ask yourself, if I had to do without one of my senses, what would it be? Sight, hearing, smell, taste. And so I said, if I had to do with one of these beauties, which one would I want to have in my life and which one would I have to sacrifice if I had to? And at that point in time, it was human beauty because of my reaction. The mountains inspired awe, inspired reverence, but they didn't inspire those tears of joy. Next one, approach to the holy mountain, the Tadden. All my through hikes have been northbound simply because being an educator, the semester ended in early May, so we go northbound. <coughs> and <coughs> I had eight groups up the Appalachian Trail, and that's probably the thing I'm most proud about, those eight groups. 
and all that it entailed. And the power of those unbroken circles on top of Katahdin, unbroken circles, 100% completion rate, and all it took from everyone in the group to get there. Very powerful. So the last day, so we didn't have to deal with Baxter State Prison, we'd camp outside of the park. And we walked the 10 miles at night and walked very quietly to Katahdin Stream Campground and then climb Katahdin so we could be up the mountain and have the summit pretty much to ourselves before the crowds come. You were referring to that yourself. Yes. So friends would join us. And this particular time, we had 32 people. This is before all the mm, rules came in in terms of sizes of groups. <coughs> it was just a one day thing. And we go off into the main woods there by Penobscot River, 32 headlights. And now, if, I don't know whether you remember Fantasia by Walt Disney, this groundbreaking film using beautiful music. And there's this scene with like, they look like nuns. And they're all walking next to a misty pond at night. And they all have like candles. And the woman is singing, Ave Maria, boy. Whew. So here we have 32 lights going into the darkness. You look back, it's nice to be sort of in the front of those things. You can look back and see all those lights, like synchronized lightning bugs. And we come to like Elbow Lake, I think it's called, right before you get to the Perman Road. Usually it's about <laughs> 3 a.m. in the morning. And hopefully it's a clear night. Not all the time is a clear night, but this particular time was a clear night. I also forgot to say that the last person in this group of 32 was a man called Bill Bailey from Cincinnati. And he's a musician. And he wrapped himself all up in multicolored Christmas lights, all around, you know, not too tight around his legs so he could still walk, but all his upper part of his body. And so it was all these headlights and this Christmas tree walking through. So we get to this pond, and this is one of the rituals we would have to do uh, along our pilgrimage, which was always nice. Um, Everyone turned their lights off. He even took the batteries out of his battery-powered Christmas tree lights, and it was dark. And if the pond was placid, you could see the stars right there, and the stars above in the darkness. Maybe 14 pilgrims who walked the whole way and friends. And I would sing this song, you know, one of my heroes is Paul Robeson, who was also controversial. <clears throat> and this is the song I sang, similar to at the end of Jungle Book, when Bagheera or Baloo tells Mowgli, and now you must go back to man. And Mowgli cried and cried and cried. And so this is the song. <clears throat> going home, going home. We are going home. Stars are bright, nights alight. We are going home. Going home, going home. We are going home. Stars are bright, 
nights alight, we are going home, going home, going home. We are going home. Stars are bright, nights alight. We are going home. We are going home. And finally, and good, this is good, we'll have time for some questions. One more thing. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, what is the finest literary moment on the trail? Anybody? Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, the statue of Walt Whitman, ironically in the Bear Mountain Zoo. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> the only place where the trail is locked. It never stopped me, of course, but you know, you have to be there during office hours. It's almost like bank hours now, 10 to 4.30. <clears throat> There's some nice literary quotes in the granite on Mount Greylock, too. Mm. Emerson and Thoreau. And it's funny, I've spent time there observing, and I've seen some hikers go by Walt Whitman. Yeah, like this. And there used to be, uh, at the foot of Walt Whitman, this bronze statue with their hand reaching out. The opening quotes of Song of the Open Road. I don't know how many hiker weddings I've been asked to read that. Leonard and Lori, um, you know, the umbrella lady, and you know, they got married on Peaks of Otter and they wanted me to recite Song of the Open Road. It's about taking journeys, right? <clears throat> so this is what I want to end my little talk with. <laughs> A foot. And light-hearted, I take to the open trail. I'm healthy. I'm free. The world is before me. The long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth, I ask not good fortune. I, myself, am good fortune. Henceforth I whimper mo no more, postpone no more. I need nothing. I'm done with libraries and indoor complaints and querulous criticisms. <laughs> Strong and content I travel the open trail. Camarado, I give you my hand. Will you not come travel with me? For my love, my love is more powerful than money. So that includes my little thing. I appreciate having this time so thank you to Jim and the committee for taking my suggestion. Uh, can I have a little time besides the five minutes? <laughs> so. so we have time for questions, which I'm glad. And I'll end about 10 of to give the next people time to set up if we go that long. But time for questions. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, seeing how this is a whole thing, you're being inducted. Yeah. What would you consider one of your biggest contributions to the Appalachian Trail? 
Well, uh, I'd like to think as an educator, uh, I'd like to think that the Appalachian Trail Institutes and the expeditions have, uh, I, my contribution is that uh, people have been able to fulfill their dreams because of the way they've been prepared. Uh, everything I do is political. Now, I'm not meaning by Republicans or Democrats or red or blue, any of that. I believe that my country or any country is only as strong as the number of its citizens who have fulfilled their dreams. You know, Langston Hughes told us about the dangers of deferred dreams. What happens to a dream deferred? So I have felt that I've, the way I serve my country, and I'm st still serving my country, is to help facilitate people to fulfill their dream of walking the Appalachian Trail anyways, whether it's through hike, section hike, or whatever. Because I know, because of that experience, they're going to be better people. And that's good for our country. So my, the thing I'm proudest about, uh, you know, somebody else will walk the trail more than 18 times. That, you know, people always ask me that question, but it, it won't be someone in my demographic where I never quit a job or lost a job. I helped raise two children off to college, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, I'm not a trust fund baby, I'm first generation college, you know, from working class background. Uh, so that, you know, somewhere along the line, someone will do that. But no one will ever duplicate taking eight groups up the whole trail with about a 96% completion rate. That will never happen again. You know, people ask me, well, why don't you train somebody? And I say that it doesn't take about training. And you really, you have to be a rule breaker to do that. And we all like to follow rules. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Ron. Warren, I'd be, um, you know, the discussion that I often have with fellow AT hikers is how are the, um, how is it, how, how different are the hikers today than, yeah. and I'll, and I'll let, put, let me put in two, two, two categories. You know, you've, you've had eight groups over a period of several decades. So would you, could, would you sort of compare, contrast those, those people as to, their motivation, their behavior, whatever. And yeah. then the larger question, because I know when I was the head of ATC, we heard a lot of this and it really bothered me. Oh yeah, all these people are just coming out here to you know, hang yeah. out on the trail now and smoke pot and big groups. <laughs> and in fact, I found well over 90% of the hikers were people motivated to have their dream. So what would you say about how the, the hiker composition has changed? Yeah. Well, I can't speak for changes in the expeditions because they were highly, everyone was prepared the same way, you know, drew the same sort of people. You know, these are people who uh, value commitment and they're all self-selected. So there, that was a constant. In terms of general, there's always going to be change. And, you know, how do you judge change? Uh, I will say that there's a lower percentage of people that are getting the gifts of the trail. You know, so there's a difference between knowing about things and thoughts. So, you know, like Harry Chapin said, uh, somebody can travel 10,000 miles and still be right where you are. So, um, they're not getting the gifts of the trail. And they're bringing, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was always to be a haven and refuge from everyday life, you know, from the stresses of city life or whatever, to have this trail, a, a refuge, to separate the two. But, you know, people increasingly bringing the world with them. So if the world is becoming more regulated, it's brought to the trail, rules to the trail, side hustles to the trail, technology to the trail. So 
uh, I stopped trying to change the world at a relatively young age. I'm glad because I, you know, my mentor was Don West, and you know, he, there was a bit of sadness. You know, Robert Frost said on his epitaph, "I had a lover's quarrel with the world." Anybody who is, believes in beauty, beauty of words, beauty of nature, will have a quarrel with the world. So I try not to have a quarrel with the world, certainly not with individuals, maybe with institutions, but not individuals. Um, so my mantra is, uh, if you can't beat them, don't join them. <laughs> and I can't beat them. So I'm not going to join them. So uh, I don't spend too much time. I, I guess I'm saddened when I see I see two groups of people up at Route 15 in Monson. You know, I've spent you know a couple of days every year is just sitting in that parking lot before the end to the Hundred Mile Wilderness. You know, last trail town for the North Bounders, and talking to them that there's a higher percentage of people now that just want to get it over with. And I remember one time, there's this old fella, big white beard, and he was starting, you know, on, you know, he just got dropped off out of a cup from a car, finishing up. I said, boy, you look like you've come a long way. And he said, yeah, I've come from Georgia. And I reached out my hand. I said, well, congratulations. So said, well, don't congratulate me yet. I still got 115 more miles. I said, well, I'm probably not going to be on Katahdin when you finish. So congratulations. <laughs> and I went to my car and then, I hear this sobbing, just sobbing. I turn and I could see his back and it was obviously he was sobbing. He was looking at that sign. I said, you okay? And he, he just turned around with tears in his eyes and he said, I just don't want this to end. So where are you gonna be after 2,180 miles? Are you gonna wanna get it all over with or do you want to start? And the people that are sorry that it's ending are the people who are getting the gifts of the trail. Uh, as I said to someone earlier, someone asked, describe yourself in three words. Uh, and I said, this is just recent. I said, an, an observer at peace. That's the stage of my life right now. She wrote a poem about it, which I thought was pretty cool. But so I, I can't change it. It saddens me, but what can you do? More questions. Thanks for that question. I don't know whether I answered it well. I do a, a program. I will do a program at the gathering. You know, changes over the last fifty years. I've been doing it at trail days every year, and it's good because it's. A, it's a whole hour and 15 minutes, and we go down, make up all the categories that we want, you know, equipment, you know, uh, maintenance, uh, technology. We go through the whole thing. But this, you know, I wasn't planning to. That could take a long time. More questions. We still got a few questions, I mean, a little time here. Terry, you got any questions? Uh, I'm trying to think. Okay. Yeah. Terry was in the 2005 AT expedition, so she experienced the unbroken circle on top of Katahdin. Well, the, Chris Calloway, you know, the long start to the journey, they did a really nice interview, beautiful interview at the folk school, which is my last hurrah. If you're all down trail days, I'm only 12 miles from Damascus, please, if I'm around, please feel free to come visit the folk school. Uh, and Chris Calloway asked, asked the question, what do you feel, once again, um, the best about? And I said, the, the f ends, the ends of the journey, the ends of the journey. And at the time, I was, I had finished the trail 16 times, and I, I said, I have 16 special moments that I will accompany me to my 
deathbed, along with all these other epiphanies. Terry was at three of my finishes, 2005, 2010, on top of Katahdin, and then when I, well, at four, <laughs> uh, time I finished on Angel's Rest above Perisburg because it was close to pipe stem. I like to finish where uh, at my heart homes in the Folk Life Center, and pipe stem is one of my heart homes. It's heart home of Alda as well. And then uh, at uh, uh, Bulls Bridge in Connecticut, where I was conditioned and trained. At the time, I thought I was being educated, but I was educated and set free on the Appalachian Trail, in the mountains of Jamaica, and in the coal fields of Appalachia. And Terry was there when I finished, and it was a very emotional time. So, yes, thank you. Yeah. Could you uh, offer us any prophecies? either about your own next uh, period of time or yeah. the trail or... Uh, well, I, I hope to have 20 years left. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, but I did have my four Gump moment in 2015. I was on... I did two more expeditions. Uh, they weren't circle expeditions because I didn't have the emotional fortitude to hold people to this commitment, but people still wanted a hike. So I had two expeditions, which turned out really remarkable. Uh, and I was in the White Mountains by, weather was beautiful, beautiful, I was feeling fine. And then all of a sudden, you know, just like Forrest Gump there in Monument Valley, Valley you know, I just stopped and this thing saying, I don't have to do this anymore. And I sat down on a rock, because it was like, Oh my goodness, what is this? And I thought for about an hour and a half, still the same. And so I broke, there was a little birch tree on the ground there. I was dead and I broke it off into little pieces and I pushed them down in between some saplings to make a gate. I don't know why I did that. But it was that I'm tired I think I'll go home now. So that was the end of my purposeful hiking. And because I'm a, still an achiever, I, in 2018, I had 100 miles left to do in the Whites. And I finished on August 20th, 2018. And I just thought of Bob Dylan's song, I shall be released. So I don't do purposeful. I'm still connected to the trail. I'm still doing the Appalachian Trail Institute. Still doing the smart hikes. But, and uh, I, I knew there was ramifications. There's cons. Look at me. Overweight. Yeah, you know, I used to have, every five years, I knew I was going to lose 30, 40 pounds. So there are cons. Uh, but I, want to I wanted to stop the trail on my own terms. And I wanted to dance well into my 80s. I've never had trouble with my knees, and I didn't want to push it. When I came down that Webster Cliff Trail, I was a happy man. I said I made it. I made 38,000 miles without hurting my knees. And now I'm going to dance. Of course, the sad thing is, is that, was, that passion was taken away from me for at least a year. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> or not well I, um, yes partly I, i'm also okay uh, what did i miss then yeah you said something about uh, earlier about the uh, the difference in the hyper community mm -hmm. um can you project in the oh or the, the community or the trail itself or uh well are people still going to be doing this 20 years from I, I have thought for a very long time a very long time for about 40 years. The greatest threat to the Appalachian Trail and all it stands for is not overdevelopment. It's not encroachment. It's liability. That's the greatest threat to this slender thread of simplicity and freedom. So, yeah, uh, when Maine made their state a lot harder, 
All the states are less hard than they were in 1973 because of all the maintenance and stuff. But Maine made it harder because, uh, you know, big deal with the lumber companies. We'll give you all this land. We can't lumber way up on the ridges if you give us this land down here where the trail was, if you move the trail. So uh, Maine became very hard. And I remember talking to Dave Field. I said, aren't you worried about being sued? Because this was like near, oh, this, this uh, cup of coffee is hot. I got burned. You know, I'm going to sue McDonald's, you know, you know, you know, you know. Hot, caution, hot. Okay, you know. Um, and he said, well, we have sort of the same lawyers as AMC. I said, okay. But uh, I wouldn't put it past uh, our highly litigious society that something's going to happen in the legal field that's going to... It, it has stopped a lot of really good things. It has stopped a lot of really good-hearted people. And so that to me... You're welcome. I think we'll have a uh, thing for one more question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I hear two things while you're talking. One, the journey is the destination. Mm. And two, if you work with all these people to finish the trail. Mm. And I wonder if you could kind of reconcile that or talk to that a little bit. Oh, well, I tell people what I have found, the, the rationalization that you cannot argue with is that people who stop, you know, the 75% or the 70%, and, and this isn't for an accident. This isn't for an unavoidable injury. You know, you fall and you break your leg, you're not going to hike, right? That's understandable. But, you know, what I hear is people start saying, it's more about the journey than the destination. How can you argue with that? You can't. However, I maintain that if you reach your destination, you will have your journey. Mm -hmm. So that's my pat answer to that. Did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, th thank you again for being here. Beautiful room. I'm honored that this is the first talk. I'm honored that uh, there's some words of Walt Whitman in here, some words of John Muir in here. And looking out at whoever thought something like that would happen in southern Pennsylvania. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>